This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. That they won't be going to White Castle after. <laughs> I hope not. No. Okay. So the idea is you don't have to go to White Castle. <laughs> right. See? That's why we're cooking. The goal isn't to get, you know... Real, real messed up. It's just to have a very kind of nice background noise going on. And to... you know, honestly, if you want to, still be in bed by nine. Right, right. <laughs> and not, and we're not drinking, so yeah. so it's almost like you know, have a wonderful time, have a wonderful party, and and no consequences. Cannabis and food have a special relationship. Take those post-smoke munchies made famous by films like 2004's Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. <laughs> Looks like you guys had some night, huh? <laughs> I want 30 sliders, five french fries, and four large cherry Cokes. I want the same, except make mine Diet Cokes. Chuck. And, of course, there are baked classics like weed brownies and confections like THC-infused chocolate truffles. So it's no surprise that cannabis doesn't bring fine dining to mind. This summer, though, two of St. Louis's top chefs, Alex Henry, chef and co-owner of El Molino del Sureste and Sureste Mexican, and Nick Bogner, chef owner of Indo and Sado, are taking part in Suede Cannabis's Best Buds pop-up series and hosting culinary events that expand and elevate the range of foods people associate with cannabis in its many forms. Joining me in studio to whet our appetites with notes about how they're approaching their respective pop-ups, we have the chefs themselves, Nick Bognar and Alex Henry. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Hello, thanks for having us. Yep, thanks for having us. So Suede Cannabis is collaborating with local chefs for Best Buds. It's already done two of them with Nathan Wright of Uplate, who's been on our show and and brought some of the food here, and uh, the pizza guy. Now, before the two of you were approached uh, by Brandon Cavanaugh at Suede, had you experimented with cannabis in food that you cooked like on a more casual basis, Nick? Uh, yeah, I would say I've definitely experimented with cannabis a few times, uh, maybe more than a few times. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we're very cannabis friendly, especially at my restaurant. You know, um, I think for a lot of us, it's a it's a wonderful kind of way to use cannabis with food, mm-hmm. and a lot of us have been messing around with it forever, you know, unofficially. Um, and this is definitely going to be kind of like the coolest way I've ever been approached to doing it, and okay. I'm really excited to do it uh, in association with people who really, really know what they're doing. Um, and that's kind of like for me why I just one of the reasons why I said yes to mm-hmm. Alex. For you and your brother Jeff. When you were approached, I mean, was it a no-brainer to say yes? Like, why was it that you accepted the invitation? Oh, yeah, I I feel like it was definitely kind of a no-brainer to say yes. Um, You know, it's something that unprofessionally we've, or not professionally, we've played around with. So it'll be a great opportunity to, for the first time, actually professionally do this with people that do know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and uh, kind of uh, seems, I think I saw a recent statistic that... uh, daily cannabis consumption has now surpassed daily alcohol consumption. So mm-hmm. it, it just seems like it'd be kind of silly not to explore the uh, possibilities of cannabis-infused dinners. Right. Was that part of your calculation too, Nick, as far as you know, how much more uh, people are at least openly talking about consumption of cannabis? You know, I don't think immediately that was part of my decision making. Um, you know, we were going to do it regardless. You know, I think everyone at Indo is extremely, you know, pro weed. We're all so excited to do something like this. It's very fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, knowing more about that now, it's kind of amazing, actually, how many more people are cool with you know, trying uh, infused, you know, gummies or edibles in general, and especially the demographics too. Mm-hmm. such a wide range of people doing this. And it actually makes me very happy to see people doing it uh, uh, more commonly than drinking, actually. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what had caught my eye about this, um, about this series is that, you know, you had the first two with like late night food, which is commonly associated with pot. But then fine dining just seemed like oh, this is something that's a little bit different. I mean, what are your thoughts <clears throat> on that, Alex? Uh, I mean, I think it, it makes perfect sense. You know, I, I know a lot of people, myself included, that uh, kind of prefer sometimes uh, being in 
in that headspace going into a nice higher end dinner, uh, you know, it kind of just uh, allows me to more enjoy all of the food. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I know a lot of other folks do that too. So you know, yeah. I, I'm very interested to see how the public takes it. Mm-hmm. So doing your own respective things um, with cannabis, I mean, what foods you you make? So Alex at El Molino, Don Cereste, and Cereste, Mexican, it's regional Mexican cuisine. Correct. How is it that um, that infusing cannabis sort of works already with what it is you do? Well, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where there's such a variety of different flavors and aromas in cannabis, and some of them are actually kind of similar to some, uh, you know, aromatic herbs that we use. One mm-hmm. that comes to mind is like some of the more skunky varieties of cannabis can sometimes have like hints of that turpentininess that's kind of reminiscent of epazote, which is an herb that we use, Mm -hmm. um, you know, a whole lot. Um, And then there's other ones with citrusy notes. So I I really think that the different kind of herbal aromas and flavors will lend themselves very well to the cuisine. Mm -hmm. And with the the Asian fusion food that you've become so well known for, Nick, how is it that cannabis, especially in its different forms, makes sense with the, the food that you already know how to make so just like you know like alex was saying with a lot of the aromatics there's a ton of these these terpenes that they're taking out of different flower uh, or or varietals of cannabis and for me the one that kind of hit the nail on the head was all this amazing seafood kind of flavors and these underlying flavors that we get with these interesting ingredients that we get out of a lot of it out of japan one of the ones that really impressed me uh, Japanese sea urchin. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. So I'm kind of looking to do something interesting with that. Okay. I think that'd be kind of a, the, the surprising bite for sure. But you get these flavors that you can't really quite put your finger on. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, something like sea urchin is a delicacy. And I have definitely seen some cannabis strains that have a wonderful kind of pairing with that, which is really exciting as right. well. Um, but, you know, there's tons of ways to do it. And in fact, you know, you can almost do it without affecting the flavor at all as well, mm-hmm. too. What is one of the items maybe that you will be offering at your pop-up um, in July that sort of illustrates a little bit of what you've been talking about? Yeah, so I know I'm, you know, kind of the classic thing that we thought of first, and I, you know, I hate to say it, but it's almost an easy choice was the shrimp toast that we do. Um, so, you know, we take union loafers bread, we make a farce out of shrimp, and we we kind of deep fry the whole thing. And then on top of that is like these kind of big, bold flavors, sweet, sour, spicy, um, and we're doing sweet chili sauce. Um, and most likely we're going to be infusing that sweet chili sauce. So, you know, weed sweet chili mango sauce sweet Mm -hmm. spicy you know just pour it in my mouth (laughs) it should be awesome right and alex tell us a little bit maybe about one of the the things that you know that you will be offering on your menu in a couple weeks from now okay so i mean one of the things i know i will be offering is something where i kind of play with that uh similarity of some of the skunkier strains kind of being reminiscent of epazote which is an herb that we use a lot and uh You know, it's an herb that usually the flavor of it's kind of a little bit more hidden in there and melds into things. It doesn't really stand out super strong on its own, but it really ties things together. So one of our uh, uh, dishes that we sell a lot of, the cachil siquil, which is these ground pepita dumplings that have some epazote in them and Mm -hmm. have a broth that's made with achiote and epazote and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's a totally vegan dish. It's very tasting and a uh, nice, refreshing way to, to open up your meal. So we'll probably play around with that as a starter using mm-hmm. kind of a skunky strain in place of epazote. Okay. Now, the question then is experimenting and then also like trying things maybe that don't work. Have you encountered that already, Alex? Um, So I am quite certain that I will. One of the things that we're going to play around is trying to infuse some tortillas. And so the kind of iffy part on there is if the heat will uh, that is required to cook a tortilla will end up killing the product that we put in there or not. So I anticipate probably a pretty high potential of failure on that. But, you know, Mm -hmm. that's that's why we're going to R&D it first. Yeah. So, you know, there may be people who are hearing what we're talking about and they hear skunky or skunkier strains that does not sound appetizing how would you respond to those who have uh, that kind of reaction and nick especially with food like seafood that can have very distinct 
um, fragrance, right? We're pretty used to that, you know. Um, being in St. Louis, there's a lot of people who haven't had the, you know, um, <clears throat> they haven't had a lot of the things that we serve. And I think one of the things we do really well, and I'm sure Alex is the same way, is introducing people to this food and having people come in with an open mind and just be willing to try it and then hopefully be served correctly and when they're ready and you know trusting us to do what we do which is make things taste delicious to mm -hmm. anyone which is important for me and that was always important for me at indo too and yeah when somebody says sea urchin sauce or infused sea urchin sauce or something like that you know it could be a little scary and there is flavors like you know the flavor of the ocean and stuff and not everybody is ready for that um i think that you have to trust people like alex and i to hopefully do it in a way where it's not going to freak anyone out it's not going to be something that is overwhelming right. at all or going to be off-putting. Mm -hmm. And that's important in all cooking, too. So yeah. for me, you know, introducing people, teaching them about what it is we make is kind of our lifeblood at both of our restaurants, mm -hmm. you know. And right. that gets them back every time. As soon as you get somebody to fall in love with something that they've never had before. I mean, I've had these dumplings that I didn't even know those were vegan, by the way. Those things are oh, incredible. The pepitas, it's yes. a pumpkin pumpkin seeds and that's definitely yes. something yeah. i crave uh -huh. when i think about alex's restaurant and i mean that's the first time i ever had it you give somebody something for the first time and they enjoy that i mean it's that's kind of like the best thing you can do with food right right well and as far as uh talking about the food i know that at indo um that there is a practice of of telling people what it is they're having is that also going to be part of what you, Nick, will be doing, and, and also Alex, as you are bringing people into your restaurant space on a day that it's normally closed, and sort of marrying what your, your restaurants are known for with something that is new? Yeah, I think that's gonna have to be a big part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's gonna wanna know what they're eating. That's huge. I mean, I think it's also really cool when somebody, you know, somebody puts down a plate at your table and you get a little bit more information than maybe you did when you ordered it. And it's kind of building that way. And you're like, oh, that's why I really like this. It has this ingredient or this is the technique of why I really enjoy it. Yeah. We're doing a cocktail party, so that's going to be a little different. But I think it'll also give us a ta chance to talk a lot about mm -hmm. what we're doing back there in the kitchen that night. So that's yeah. pretty cool, too. OK. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, absolutely. We're definitely going to um, kind of stick with our same format of be very, very descriptive when we drop dishes off so that everyone knows, you know, exactly what they're having. Because on the menu, you really the descriptions are limited to just a few words. You really can't get everything on there to, to explain what it is. And it's a lot better once it's in front of them. So mm -hmm. we, we definitely plan on being very descriptive with um, what's in there and mm -hmm. why we chose to infuse certain things in a certain way. I would also imagine that as people are listening, they're thinking, okay, so it's cannabis infused food. So uh, you might get very elevated, you know, beyond a point where you feel safe. But with this suede um, partnership, they're being very, very conscientious about how much is uh, how, how much cannabis is in these dishes, right? Uh, absolutely. And that's where that's where suede comes in, because they're the professionals at that stuff, um, you know, uh, me, me and Nick are not necessarily dosage control specialists, so mm -hmm. um, that that is where their expertise will play a pretty vital role. Right. Now, another thing that I think is important to note here, Alex, you'd mentioned um, that people are now at least reporting that they're consuming cannabis more regularly than they're having alcohol. And these, these dinners are going to be no crossfade zones, meaning that there will be no alcohol uh, for these dinners. What possibilities did that open up, especially around beverages, Alex? Oh, so for beverages, uh, in, in Mexican cuisine, we have a, a huge culture of aguas frescas and different non-alcoholic beverages. So we definitely plan on uh, probably having some some part of this dinner that is almost reminiscent of like a uh, drink pairing where we'll have an agua fresca that might be infused to go with a couple of different courses together. Mm -hmm. And Nick, you also had, had mentioned that there will be some drinks, non-alcoholic yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah. the, the bar team is going to be collaborating on some pretty, the first drafts are also sounding amazing. Um, we're not fully finished with that yet, but I am very excited to just, you know, see what they do with the mocktails that have the cannabis infusions. Um, <clears throat> the cool thing about mocktails is that I feel like the creativity side is just, you know, no ceiling. You know, mm -hmm. you can kind of go crazy with it. You're not forced to use certain spirits 
And and those usually are the driving force of why drinks are going to taste that way. Yeah. And, you know, with this, it's like, OK, you know, make something that's just delicious. And there's really no there's really nothing stopping you from going just, you know, something that's just like like Alex probably do Agua Fresca. I mean, that's just delicious. I could right. drink like 18 of those, you know. Um, I think that's going to be the same thing with these co- these mocktails that we're going to be doing as well. So I'm right. pretty excited. And Nick, you'd mentioned that the approach that you will be <clears throat> taking is less a, a sit down dinner, you know, fine dining. Um, there will be fineness, but you'll be doing a, a cocktail party. Why is it that you decided to to take that particular approach with this pop up dinner? Um, you know, num- one of the big reasons was we just kind of wanted to change it up a little bit. We've been, you know, every time we do, we do New Year's, we do Valentine's Day, and we do wine dinners always in that format of like multi coursed very kind of like sit down and, and honestly almost a little bit longer form of dining than even we do at the normal restaurant. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do love those dinners, but we, you know, I wanted to do something a little new and see how the Indo space would be in a kind of a more casual format. And then being that the dinner is going to be on a Tuesday night. Um, I thought it might be cool for people to come and go as they please, socialize with their friends, have a long, have a nice fun time. And, you know, honestly, if you want to still be in bed by nine right, right. <laughs> and not, and we're not drinking. So, yeah. so it's almost like, you know, have a wonderful time, have a wonderful party and, and no consequences the next day. You know, mm-hmm. we've done wine dinners in the middle of the week and not everybody can make it to those, you know, people have their own busy schedules and, and I think it'll be fun, you know, just to change it up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Alex, with what you'll be doing, um, and this is uh, Monday, just a couple weeks from now. Correct. Are there any experiential kinds of uh, considerations that you made for people to enjoy not just what they're eating, but like, ambiance, um, something that they'll they'll take away and remember that might be a little bit different from what they usually would get when they're at your restaurant. Yeah, I think that we plan on having some slight variations on maybe like the the lighting and the uh, the choices of music that we put in. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, we do want to still keep it pretty close to the the a similar experience to what you would normally have right. uh, coming to eat with us because we're just kind of trying to play around with the idea of a dinner that uses cannabis as opposed to alcohol, mm-hmm. um, and kind of trying to help break through through that kind of stereotype of you know cannabis being associated more with munchies food and right. kind of fast food and being able to do it with something in the kind of a, a more elevated situation. Mm-hmm. Now, you'd mentioned, you know, both of you, Sway Cannabis, they're the experts in dosage. But can either of you kind of speak to what extent people might be experiencing a high after eating the food that you're preparing or, or the drinks that you're infusing? So I know what we're going for is just a very, very light, subtle, nothing too crazy, just kind of everyone feeling a little bit good, feeling happy, uh, nothing crazy or paranoid at all. And I think mm-hmm. that's super important to this experience going well. Um, and I've been assured that that's, that's going to be the case for yeah. everyone. So it should be highly monitored. Um, and then obviously the big thing for the cocktail party is you're going to have that option to have that infused food and mocktail and then we're going to have all that stuff still available uninfused as well so oh, you can okay. kind of continue to eat and drink as you please right yeah. so there'll be a range of things mm-hmm. yes yeah, so similarly we're uh, keeping the the dosage you know pretty moderate as well mm-hmm. and uh you know we'll have uh also options that are not infused for for everything so for the the starter which i plan on having infused we'll have if anyone doesn't want it infused an uninfused option and then some of the uh other infusions down the line are either like an agua fresca, which they could also easily have one that's not infused, mm-hmm. or uh, you know sauces or tortillas to accompany, which uninfused options are also completely going to be available. So it'll kind of be a, a bit of a guide your own journey for for the guests as far as their consumption of the uh, of the cannabis itself. But uh, you know, even if they consumed everything, it's not going to get anyone to a to a place crazy with, high level. Right, right. They won't be going to. Uh, the the movie they won't be going to White Castle after. <laughs> I hope not. No. Okay. No, the idea is you don't have to go to White Castle. Right. right. So, <laughs> that's why we're cooking. You know. Sure. If sure. we can nail the dose and everyone can just feel elated, have a great meal, feel good, I think that's going to be just so awesome. Uh-huh. It's going to be such an amazing experience that way. Um, and that's be the, the goal sign. for me, and I'm sure it is for Alex as well. Oh yeah. yeah. Similarly to having a, a drink pairing when you go out mm-hmm. to you know mm-hmm. the goal isn't to get you know 
real real messed up. It's just to have a very kind of nice background noise going on to to ele- elevate the experience a little bit. Yeah. And is preparing for these pop-ups, is this giving you any thoughts about incorporating cannabis more regularly into what you offer, be it on a like a seasonal basis or maybe to do other events that are similar? After you, you kind of see how this all goes, Alex? Uh, yeah, I mean, we definitely would be uh, interested in, in looking into some of those options. I do believe at the moment we can't do it without uh, someone licensed like Suede being part of the of the formula to make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, we would definitely be down to do more of these in the future too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes. I would think at the very least regularly or once a year, however that ends up being. Right. And maybe, you know, the two of us together can do something like that too. That'd be fun too. That makes it easier, oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So home cooks who are listening right now, they might be used to working with alcohol on food. That That's a, something that's very common. Maybe not as much with cannabis and particularly with foods that, that could be... Um, significantly change sort of in their flavor profile if they're not using like a high quality product. Do you have any advice for those who maybe want to dabble with some of that cooking with cannabis? Well, or? I guess uh, there's, there, the, that, the so, excuse product. me, yeah, go ahead, Alex, oh, you yeah, got it right there. Yeah, yeah. So no, please. Yeah. yeah, so actually the, the, one of the products that they're giving us for this dinner is these uh, stirrables, which are essentially flavorless uh water soluble that you can just put into everything uh, and they you know are little packets that are dosage controlled Mm -hmm. so you know a good portion of these dinners is going to be using those products so uh, i would say for home cooks that's yeah you know it shouldn't affect the flavor of anything really at all right Um, yeah that's what i was going to say too i'm very excited about that because it's control it's easy and it should make you know having this dinner just right locked in on the right dose yeah Mm -hmm. how about for those who really want to know like when they're tasting it, <laughs> there's something in there. <laughs> I would say, I guess it's quality, right? Quality over quantity. Yeah. Um, if you have a better strain that tastes good, I'm certain that extracting from that's going to make it better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think in, in those situations, you're really looking at the strain more for flavor than you are for, you know, the the effects of it. Yeah. So the last question here, what are you looking forward to most about the pop-up that's going to happen at your restaurant? Uh, I mean, one of the things I'm looking forward to to the most is kind of having an early on course where we get to play around with some of the different flavors of of the flower itself, Um, you know, and then also to guests reactions, you know, through the whole experience Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to kind of the socialization that's going to be happening. Um, You know, I think it's going to be really fun to, you know, kind of experience the effects of this with my guests, you know, for the first time and have a good time. Right. And the kind of after effects of this dinner and the more normalization of what this is i think you know we talked about that a little bit i think that's going to be really cool if this is something that's just people know happens and is a thing i feel like that really does kind of change modern dining a little bit and that that, that's really exciting to me as well new frontiers yeah nick bogner is chef and owner of indo in botanical heights as well as sado in the hill neighborhood and Alex Henry is chef and co-owner of El Molino del Cereste in Southampton and Cereste Mexican in City Foundry. Alex and Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. This episode was produced by Emily Woodward. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.